All right. Well, it is good to be here, and we are here to talk about building a brand that sticks. And basically, the uh, things that we're going to try and cover today are, you know, what is branding? If you ask a lot of people what branding is, you will get a lot of different answers. What are the basic elements of a brand? How do you build brand loyalty? And how do you do that in uh, the modern day environment of, of 2015? Um, so to start, we'll give basically a, a definition of a brand. So um, where we'll start is by using a definition by Seth Godin. And this, his definition of a brand is, a brand is a set of expectations, memories, stories and relationships that taken together account for a consumer's decision to choose one product or service over another. If the consumer, whether it's a business, a buyer, a voter, or a donor, doesn't pay a premium, make a selection, or spread the word, then no brand value exists for that consumer. So one of the reasons uh, we all agree that that was a really good definition of a brand is because it really brings in the emotional context of how people view products and services. And as we um, think about companies that we like to buy from, stores that we like to visit, and brands that we like to interact with, uh, it's more than just a logo, a tagline. It's an emotional attachment that we tend to associate with the brand or the product, which allows us to uh, decide to make that decision. So as we think about some of the brands that really we think say something to us and to other people, I um, wanted to walk through a few of those. So as we think about Starbucks and what that brand stands for, obviously coffee is one of the first things that come to mind. But if you get a little bit deeper, you think about really offering a premium product, having top-notch customer service, really um, being passionate about customer advocacy and loyalty. You may be aware of a website that Starbucks runs called My Starbucks Ideas. Um, any of you who have grabbed one of the green sticks and shoved it into the top of your coffee lid, that was an idea that arose from that platform where a customer said, I always spill my coffee, I need something to plug in there. And the community and, and the people at Starbucks looked at that idea, thought it was a good one, made sense for their, their business, and they executed it. So um, they also are really great at doing partnerships with other brands. If you've been in a Starbucks as of late, you probably take advantage of the iTunes cards for different apps or songs. And recently, if you go on the website, when you log in to get free Wi-Fi, you'll notice that they're starting to tell uh, match stories. So doing a partnership with Match.com and all of the people who met the loves of their lives at Starbucks. Another um, brand that we really like is Tom's. And if you're not familiar, for every pair of Toms that you buy, they donate one to someone in need. So that brand really has an altruistic quality. Um, it's also a, a great product. It's trendy and, and people really like wearing Toms. Um, and then from a local aspect in Cleveland, we think that Heinen's really has a, a brand that people relate to. When you think of what it's like shopping at a Heinen's grocery store, you think of friendly service, um, definitely celebrating local produce and, um, and small businesses. You get quality products, and it really has a great sense of uh, word of mouth from its community, really stands strong behind its brand. So if we were to recap, you know, just thinking about those three quick examples, you know, what a brand is and how you know, companies really live the brand, as Kevin said, it, it's, really, it's not just about the visual identity, although that's something we'll talk a lot about, um, today, but it's it's more about the emotional connection and and the values and what that brand represents to you as a as a customer as a loyalist, uh, um, and then when you think about what's important about building a brand, you know, really taking that inside out approach, living it, being authentic, um, that has to come first before your audience and your customers will really embrace your brand. And, and I think one of the things that's most important there that Christina mentioned is the idea of being memorable. So there are so many products that um, just do not stand out from the crowd. And knowing that a lot of people that are probably listening to this podcast are starting companies or thinking about starting companies, um, when you start to build your brand, it really needs to be built off of something that you're truly passionate about an idea, a thought, a product that you know that you can get behind, that you know your employees can get behind, and that you can live every day. So nothing 
defeats a brand or 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 allows it not to gain traction more than something that doesn't stand out or whose employees don't really live the brand, so to speak. So as an example of of being memorable, we wanted to show just a quick video clip um, that talks about how generic a brand can be if it is uh, trying to please all audiences. We think first of vague words that are synonyms for progress and pair them with footage of a high-speed train. Science is doing lots of stuff that may or may not have anything to do with us. See how this guy in a lab coat holds up a beaker? That means we do research. Here's a picture of DNA. There are a shitload of people in the world, especially in India. See how we're part of the global economy? Look at those farmers in China. But we also do business in the USA, or want you to think we do. Check out this wind energy thing in Indiana, and this blue collar guy with dirt on his face. Also, we care about the environment, loosely. Here's some powerful rushing water and people planting trees. Our policies could be related to these panoramic views of Costa Rica. In today's high-speed environment, stop-motion footage of a city at night with cars turning quickly makes you think about doing things efficiently and time passing. Lest you think we're a faceless entity, look at all these attractive people. Here's some of them talking and laughing and close-ups of hands passing canned goods to each other in a setting that evokes community service. Equality, innovation, honesty, and advancement are all words we choose from a list. Our profits are awe-inspiring, like this guy who's looking up and pointing at a skyscraper or a kite while smiling and explaining something to his child using a specific ratio of Asian people to black people to women to white men, we want to make sure we represent your needs and interests, or at least a version of your skin color in our ads. Did we put a baby in here? What about an ethnic old man whose wrinkled smile represents the happiness and wisdom of the poor? Yep. So there you have it. There's a relatively long video um, using every possible stereotype of visual, of voiceover, of word meant to describe a brand. And absolutely, um, that, that video really has nothing memorable about it except how unmemorable it is. And we see a ton of that in advertising today. It's all over marketing, people trying to please every audience. And what they actually do is... Um, not please anybody and become completely unmemorable. So don't do that when you are starting to develop your brand. So as we've talked about, you know, a brand isn't one thing. It's really a collection of a lot of things. And while a very true statement is a brand is not a logo, a logo is a very important part of your brand. So um, in my, you know, daily life as a creative director, um, I don't like people to really oversee or, or skip over a logo. People think anybody can do it. But, you know, you really should when you start to build a brand and you build your company, focus on the logo. Focus on what it means. Do you think it stands for what you are trying to represent from your company? Um, and just to give a few ex examples of this, you know, one of the most famous logos in the world um, is the FedEx logo. And I am firmly in the camp that looked at that FedEx logo I can't, I have no idea how many times until someone pointed out that between the E and the X in the negative space is an arrow. And FedEx is very much about moving things forward, pushing the envelope. Um, and so that's a great little hidden piece of that logo that not many people notice, but is very thought out, was very thought out when they built it. One other thing to just notice about that iconic mark is 
It's made from these really blocky um, letters, and it's very intentional with the bright uh, colors to make sure that you can see it everywhere. So you can see that logo and recognize it on a plane that's flying overhead, on a truck that's going down the street. Very intentional to make sure that that logo is synonymous with them moving things to where they need to be. So it's a great example of a logo with a lot of thought behind it that may appear simple uh, at first glance. Um, one of the questions that always comes up around uh, developing a logo is how much should it cost? So I need a logo, what should I expect to pay for it? And there is absolutely no definitive answer to that question. So, you know, I am positive. There is no definitive, well, if you're the one who has to pay for it, yeah. you're going to probably put a definitive answer around it. But when people ask, you know, how much should I expect to pay? Um, the gamuts go, you know, the, Nike, one of the most famous marks in the world, uh, they paid $35 to a designer to create it. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, British Petroleum, uh, when BP decided they wanted to launch a more friendly, um, environmentally friendly logo a few years ago, they spent $221 million to develop their new mark, which looks like a flower. Um, obviously, a lot that went into that is focus groups. Um, and what does this mean? And usability and testing and market testing and obviously design after design after design. And, you know, other great examples are Twitter. The Twitter bird was a $15 um, logo. Uh, BBC, the block letters that form BBC was uh, $1.8 million spent on a logo. So it just doesn't, you just never know. But again, make sure you think it through and, uh, and do it right. Um, just a couple examples of logos and things that can go wrong. Uh, everybody around here is probably familiar with Case Western, and they relaunched their logo a couple years ago, and it's got this nice blue box with this sun coming over the horizon and is meant to represent everything that Case Western Reserves brings to its community, to its students, the idea of a brighter day through education. Very nice mark. Um, that actually replaced a mark that was in play for several years, um, that was kind of this abstract uh, mark that after it had been released into the marketplace and become synonymous with their, their brand, someone looked at it and said, it really looks like a fat man with a surfboard. Um, and the minute that started to be associated with that logo, that's what everybody saw. So they had to eventually go through a process of a new identity, um, and I don't know, but there was a good chance that maybe that uh, would have been um, seen in a focus group or a usability study or testing when they first started to develop the logo. But it's just kind of a comical example of what, when some a perception gets out of your hands, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to stop. And one other example that I think most people are probably familiar with is the company Gap a few years ago. Um, you know, a very authentic company, great story of how it was built, a logo that meant to be sort of rooted in the tradition of it, great brand awareness and identity around its mark, decided that they were going to come up with a new logo. Uh, and they sort of, without even letting anybody know, they just launched this brand new logo on the marketplace. It was very simple. And in many ways, people thought it was absolutely terrible. Instantly, they, they thought it was terrible. Instantly thought right. it was terrible, correct. Twitter blew up. And the logo actually lasted less than a week. Um, they had a huge launch campaign, launched it online. Uh, as Allison said, Twitter destroyed it. Uh, people started making their own versions of the logo. Uh, the most famous one was them replacing the word gap with crap. And they immediately went back to their old logo, uh, literally within a couple days. So... On the one side, we're talking about what to think about when you're building a brand. Um, another thing to think about is when you have an established brand, uh, make sure you're changing it for the right reasons because if people are loyal to it, they, they will remain loyal to um, it. It's interesting when you think about how people f literally freaked out about it because you maybe they didn't think that it was that authentic of a brand or that you know, nobody would care, you know, we're changing it, just doing a few little things, but people really, I can remember watching Ad Week and Ad Age just go after it and mm -hmm. thing after thing, article after article coming out, um, which is interesting because it was a clothing brand, you know, a very long-standing popular one, but at the time that people had such a negative reaction, 
um, to that new font. And it does, I mean, it does show you can get desensitized to the importance that people place on a logo. Uh, they probably thought nobody will care if we, if we replace our logo because we're Gap and we can do whatever we want. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they certainly uh, certainly learned a lesson there. That's a great segue into when we talk about creating brand loyalty, because Gap obviously did that um, with their legions of fans, and we and they heard loud and clear when people were not satisfied with what they changed. But we wanted to talk through just a few examples of how do you create brand loyalty and what does that look like. So sticking with the... Um, retail brands, if you will. We're looking at Lululemon. So this is a brand that I love, and I'm certain all the women um, who are listening probably are also fans of it. But what they've been able to do in a short period of time is really create um, a tribe that embodies the lifestyle that moves beyond just the yoga pants and the jackets. They, they do sell men's clothes, too. They do sell men's clothes, yes. Kevin, I bet you love the men's clothes as well. But what they, what they have been able to do, specifically in communities, is create little tribes and a larger tribe, I mean, I guess nationally as well. But um, when they go into the community, there are things that they'll offer free yogas on Saturday and Sunday. And they'll also do a great job of moving just beyond having free yoga, but they'll also feature local influencers throughout the store. So when you go into the store next time, take a look at the one in Eaton, you'll see um, a very talented runner, Ryan Speed, and then you'll also see a yoga teacher. So they represent the community. They have large photos in there. Um, but they, you know, they know who their target is, what they want to hear, and that's everything from the blog that they'll feature online to some of the videos they'll share, all the way down to what's happening at the store level. And I would add, too, I learned from someone who worked there, I think it was just seasonally, but they really empower their employees and challenge them to think bigger than working in retail. Um, to the extent of they want to know what your five-year plan is and you get partnered with a mentor and you get so much time to come back and share what that plan is but seems a bit atypical for you know a, a retail type of of job so again i think that's also a great example of building the brand from the inside out as well another uh, you know a great story about them is a lot of people obviously know is if you do have a strong brand it can res it can it can weather a crisis so Lululemon had the issue a few years back where there were the complaints that their, their yoga pants were sheer mm -hmm. and somewhat see-through. And they sort of just said, you know, that's, we're not really going to deal with this. And it became an issue for a short period of time. Um, and as a brand, they sort of stood by their product. The tribe, as Allison calls them, uh, stood by the product. And they basically, that was a very um, kind of just a blip along the way in terms of their, their brand story and, and, and just how passionate people are about their clothing. So also within retail is Nordstrom. So huge proponent of shopping at Nordstrom, but what they've been able to do is when you walk into a store, you know that you're always going to get stellar customer service out of working with them. So really when Christina was walking through brands earlier of Starbucks and Tom's, when we were you know giving out some key elements of what those mean to us, when I look at Nordstrom, I think they have fantastic customer service. And when you're in the store and when you're working with everyone who's there, they really do create an experience that you're unable to get um, anywhere else. You know, the customers, customer service people will work with you. They will walk around the store with you. And I think that's really a big nod to Nordstrom in and of itself because they really encourage um, their salespeople to act as their own brands, if you will, and be their own little entrepreneurs, um, whatever department they're in, whether handbags or jewelry or shoes. And one, one really interesting branding story that, um, you know, it's, it's easy to look at really large brands, but any large brand started very small. So as people are starting to build an organization and starting to figure out how they want to get their brand out, um, you know, it's, it's great to be creative in the strategy. And if you believe in it and are creative with the strategy, uh, you never know what can happen. And, you know, a great example of this is um, the case study of Dietrich Mateschitz. So he was traveling in Europe as a marketing executive for a healthcare company and um, went into this little shop, I believe, in Taiwan and tried this elixir, which made him immediately feel not jet lagged and he felt great. So he decided he wanted to bring that back to the United States and, and start a company around marketing this, this drink. Um, he decided because it's the United States, he wanted to add carbonation and so he developed what is now known as Red Bull. And the interesting thing about the story is he did all his homework and he developed what he felt was the right recipe, 
for Red Bull to be released on the United States market. And he had a focus group of multiple people who he thought were his demographic, had them try the drink, um, and across the board, people hated it. They thought it tasted weird. They didn't like what it, uh, they couldn't get past the taste, said it just tasted bad. So he's got this investment in this company. And instead of saying, well, that's the end of that, he just realized that there was no market for this type of energy drink. So he decided to set the market and create it. And he started spending a lot of money on, um, on giving the drink away for free. People have seen what people walking around in the backpacks with the Red Bull. He started giving it away. He started sponsoring sporting events and becoming synonymous with this aggressive, live life to the fullest, go hard or go home attitude by you know syncing with the X Games and developing the tagline of it gives you wings. And he basically created this brand around Red Bull that made people think, you know, I am kind of counterculture and I am hip if I am drinking Red Bull. Um, and, you know, to use the cliche, the rest is history. He, he defined and built basically the, um, the energy drink market. And now, you know, is worth billions of dollars and Red Bull is a household name around the world. So it's just an example of making sure that if you're not sure where your brand fits right away, maybe you can, uh, you can set the, you don't have to live within a mold. You can be memorable, be unique and, 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 and make your own way. I think it's also a great reminder that even huge brands, everyone starts small exactly. with a business plan, right, and at an individual level or a group of people. So it's a, it's a good reminder. And Red Bill still tastes terrible. <laughs> Do you guys agree? I feel like other people would disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I still feel like it's, uh, you know, unless maybe mixed with something else. Well, it gives you uh, wings. Still taste, but yeah, it does give you wings, apparently. So as we round out our discussion today, um, the last element of what we want to talk about is building a brand in 2015 and, and really how it relates to digital and some of those considerations there. So as we think about what that means, um, it's it relates to immediate access, being able to do e-commerce online as opposed to just at a storefront. There's really little room for errors, um, as we saw with the, the Gap example, in particular how uh, social really made a big impact on that. And we'll talk a bit about considerations for social specifically. As we look at um, this overwhelming um, array of a bunch of different logos, I think it, it brings to bear something that's pretty important and, and something that I personally talk a lot about um, in my day job. So if I you know look at KeyBank where I work, um, I say a lot that our customers are not 24-7 banking customers. They're real-life people with lots of different interests, and we can't expect that they're going to relate to us if we talk about banking 24-7. So th the point here is really to think about who your customers are all the time, not just when they're engaging with your brand. And it's really important to be relevant because another important consideration, you don't just compete against who you perceive to be your competitors, particularly when it comes to digital and social. You compete against your customers' friends, their celebrity crushes, their parents, their significant others. Um, there are a lot of influencers to consider and, and how you fit into that spectrum. Um, this image is, is one of my favorite recently, and basically the stat is that a human, the average human, has an attention span of eight seconds, while a goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. So interesting, a little startling, and uh, for me, what it really enunciates is that in you know these moments of time where you have such little time to make an impact and to be relevant and to demonstrate what your value exchange is, it really, I think, emphasizes the fundamentals of building a brand. So going back to your business plan and really defining who are your customers, why are you different, what do you offer, and being able to communicate all of that in eight seconds or less, you know, given that attention span, maybe that's eight words, you know, forget about the paragraph, you don't have time, forget about the elevator speech, it's the elevator sentence, if you will, and to really think about, you know, how do you want your brand to make people feel? Unless, of course, you're marketing to a goldfish. <laughs> True. You then, you then have one extra, <laughs> True. One extra second. One extra sentence. You got to one extra second. You have like a word. <laughs> Um, and, and I know, you know, we, we want to empower everyone to think about how you can impact your own brand, but I think that we all would agree that 
we would recommend it's really important to work with professionals to help you figure out and make sure that your aspects of your business plan are resonating and what you should consider when it comes to all of those different brand elements in particular that Kevin ran through. Um, we also have another overwhelming visual that we thought was important to share. And it, it basically lists out a bunch of different stakeholders to consider both, you know, traditional and in and, and, and the real world, so to speak, as well as online. Um, and, and really, we wanted to talk about this because we think it's important to think about who your stakeholders are. So we talked a lot about building a brand inside out. Of course, you need to think about your internal stakeholders and your employees and, you know, really um, make sure that you're living the brand from the inside out. But then to think critically about who are those people outside of your organization that can make or break your reputation. And those are the people that you really need to get in front of, to be close to, to avoid you know, the colossal mistakes of the gaps of the world that we talked about and making sure that you're not surprising those influencers. Um, so that could be, you know, people in your community. It could be online influencers like bloggers or people on Twitter. Um, it's really important to make connections with those groups, even if they're critical of your brand at the outset, um, and give them access because, I, again, they, they really are con critical components in thinking about your reputation and um, the emotional connection that people feel with your brand. And then I'll turn it over to, to Allison to, yeah, to and that's a that. good point just as we move into when Christina was talking about understanding your customer and where they're at and all those internal stakeholders and just thinking about the customer in terms of where their journey is. So as she mentioned, if there's somebody who's being critical, you know, that could come up um, in any point of the customer journey as they're going through it. So we used to think about this journey as you had to move from spot A to spot B, to spot C, but really it's changing. And as you see um, all the little bubbles that go up and down through each one through awareness, evaluation, and purchase, you really just don't have one touch point in there. They can really come in contact with you on social and awareness. Maybe they see an ad that pops up in their newsfeed about your new product. And then maybe they're talking with a friend about it. Hey, did you see this? I keep seeing this come up in my newsfeed. Then when they go to make purchase it, they're in store and they're buying it. But there's a different type of marketing um, touch points that can hit you throughout the entire customer journey and knowing that one doesn't have to happen for the other one to happen. So then when we look ahead to um, when we talk about social media, a really big component that we want to talk a little bit through is owning your brand on social, because if you don't, it's very easy for someone else to come in and own that for you. So we want to talk through just a few different examples, um, specifically for the DiGiorno one. And, and actually, I just wanted to add a little bit to that. We, I think we mentioned maybe once or twice the notion of a value exchange, and that's a marketing phrase, but essentially what it means, and particularly it's, it's very relevant in social, is that um, you're not just having one-way conversations. Social is an opportunity to have one-to-many, one-to-one, many-to-many types of conversations. And um, there's a lot of data that supports whether you are really affluent, um, whether you are not very affluent, but all different types of consumers, they still have the same types of expectations when they engage with brands on social. So they expect exclusive access and they expect some sort of deal um, or promotion, as well as great customer service. So um, for many organizations, the customer service aspect is the, the, the lowest common denominator for your brand. And a lot of times people go to social as a last resort to complain about an issue that they have. And that goes back to Allison's comment that even if you decide you, know, you don't want to do it, you don't want to get out there proactively, um, it's very easy and likely that others will do so if you, you know, ignore it or, or don't take the bull by the horns. Um, and just in terms of other types of influencers within your social connections, so leveraging social for recruiting to get feedback from your community in terms of what they might like to see as part of a product or service that you provide or, you know, that early testing. Um, it goes back to, to, to you really, there is a way to, leverage social to make those connections and give some of that early access to the people who can, who, who really can impact your reputation, particularly um, your reputation online. When is the last time you used Twitter to talk with a company? Mm. Kevin, Christina, anybody? 
to talk with a company? Oh, yeah. I, um, it was a couple weeks ago. It was locally NASA Glenn. And um, I had heard that you could do some sort of toddler program there with mm-hmm. the space aspect of it. I have a kid who wants to be an astronaut at least this week. Very fast. And um, forward forward. I, I did. I tweeted them and they never responded. And I was kind of annoyed by it. Were you asking just for information? Yeah. Just said, hey, um, can you let me know if there's any toddler programs? Have a have a space enthusiast, you know, at home. <laughs> In a four-year-old's body. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Never heard back. And, Evan? you know, um, I can't really think of the last time I communicated with a brand, but we do a lot of tweeting the company that I work for. Um, so it becomes... You know, one little caveat is that it's these are great tools, social tools, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, Facebook, to get your message across and communicate with brands. But the the underlying uh, thing there in Christina's story is she immediately probably had a perception of NASA when she didn't get a response. Mm -hmm. So here's an organization that is is using Twitter as a communications channel and obviously not realizing that uh, if you're gonna put the message out, you gotta be re- able to you know, have the conversation. So those are the, the, the pitfalls of when you can um, uh, you know, not use it correctly. And, but and, and it to is, not be selfish too, because you know, it's one thing to put your, the message you wanna put out to the people who wanna get it, but you again, that's where the value exchange comes in. Well, why do people care and what are they getting out of it? And um, there's the 80-20 rule. So on social, you should be talking 20% about yourself as a as a organization and 80% about your customer. So what does that mean? Um, there's a phrase in, mar- in marketing called lifestyle content, and it's basically information that is of interest to your customers, but isn't necessarily you talking about your company. So if you're an insurance company, um, the lifestyle aspect of your content could be talking about health and wellness or, you know, different tips, but it's not trying to sell, sell, sell. And that's, that's, and I think an easy and quick mistake that a lot of organizations new to social make, but they, you know, learn pretty quickly that they're not resonating with their consumers. It depends how they're set up internally too. So you talk about the NASA Glenn example, but there are real, some great brands who provide excellent customer service. So if you are going on to rant, um, rant or be positive, Starwood Hotels is one that they are phenomenal. I have, can't tell you how many times I forget my account number and I lock myself out of my app and I really want to look at how much that hotel is going to cost me in Chicago. And every time I feel like they must have, my customer profile must say, Allison Peltz forgets login once a month. But I bring that up because I will Maybe tweet. Maybe you should change your login. I know, I have Something so many, I forget. <laughs> but um, I will tweet out because I don't want to call on the phone because I feel like that's just, why would I do that when I have Twitter? So I tweet it out and every time their response is, we can't help you over the phone, but you'll have to do this, DM us for more. And instantly I can get that new password that I will soon forget um, in you know under 20 minutes, whereas before you'd have to call and do that. But I know that when I go there, even if I have a great experience, I was recently at in a loft in, where was I at? Houston, no, Dallas, I was glad I was in Dallas. Um, and I just checked it on Foursquare, just for whatever, and then like instantly they commented back to my tweet. I'm like, oh, you guys are listening, and I think that's a great example of when people, companies do. And it makes you feel special. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it still makes you feel special when you're like, oh, that big brand, you know, took the time to acknowledge me, or yeah. you know, favorite a tweet, or, or specifically engage, or, or reshare, yes. you know, something that, that um, you shared about the company. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and those are, you know, great examples of customer service brands, and I think, you know, not to, to, a big buzzword these days is brand storytelling. And the idea that, um, that is sort of run through this whole presentation is that, uh, that idea of value exchange. So people don't want to be talked to anymore. They want to know what value they're getting out of the communication with your brand. So eight seconds. Examples like that uh, Allison mentioned at Nordstrom, a great customer service that they live and they live at across channels. Um, a hotel that's listening to its customers, that is value add that is outside of the realm of what you typically associate with a hotel brand, which is hopefully, you know, great rooms and, and great service. So, I mean, one way to think about branding these days is, is brand storytelling. You need to tell the story of your brand and live your brand in a way that is authentic and that is giving some sort of value back to 
the person you're trying to connect with because just talking in a one-way fashion, this is what we make, this is why it's better, this is why you should buy it, is not going to work because people are expecting more and as we know, they don't have the attention span to listen to your whole story without getting anything from them for themselves. And the other end of that is empowering your customers to do your brand storytelling so that you're not saying it, but they are. They're saying it for you. And again, that goes back to the power of what it means to be a brand that, that does make an emotional connection with your audience. I think the other part that's really important is who you have behind the brand. So the Starwood Hotels could have hundreds of people actually behind it. I think they do. I remember reading a case study about it. But um, there's great examples of when brands go great and then other examples of when they go bad, depending on who's at the helm. Um, who's logged in as a community manager. And just one example of that can be DiGiorno. DiGiorno um, had a really big oops when they were trying to take advantage of what we would call as real-time marketing, so hopping on those trending hashtags. And DiGiorno sent out one tweet that said, hashtag why I stayed, you had pizza. What the person was incredibly uninformed about was that that was actually a hashtag talking about uh, domestic violence. And instantly after that tweet was sent out, um, DiGiorno responded a million apologies did not read what the hashtag was about before posting and i think we've seen huge examples of this from brands in the past and every time one of these comes across it's almost like what are you looking at but i think that goes back to who do you have at the helm of your social channels who's reading the content calendar and who's approving this stuff um, and then you know just a little bit also of just do a quick check on Click on that hashtag. Why is that trending? What is that about? Um, and know before you post. Don't be intimidated by social. And um, more importantly, don't just assume that someone who's young and perhaps more digitally savvy is best equipped to represent your brand on social. We, we see that. I, I would like to think maybe less, but a few years ago we saw that a lot. Hey, give you know social to the intern. Um, because you know they're 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 trendy with you know that type of thing, but there's a lot of danger um, in the self-publishing realm aspect of social. There's a lot of great things that can happen too, but that's definitely one where I think it's really easy to take lightly and something that um, we we can't make a stronger recommendation to um, you know get over any fears or obstacles you might have about um, the power of social for your brand and and and. And to make sure if you are not comfortable that you do work and engage with people who are. And I think one point there is, you know, the social tools are incredibly powerful and valuable to help build your brand um, and develop that two-way conversation. But the old adage has is, is never been truer about it can take um, years to build your brand up and build up equity and build up loyalty and it can take one bad mistake or one second to completely tear it down. Or 140 characters. Or 140 <laughs> characters or to just seconds. bring your brand <laughs> to the ground. Um, the DiGiorno example is, is completely um, representative of that. So to Christina's point, wherever the touch points with your brand are, you need to make sure that the people understand it, understand your mission, understand the brand position, understand how to represent your brand across uh, different channels, no matter what tool they're using. Um, and I'll just reiterate it because um, it's really important. Uh, we do see it a lot where you just have somebody who you think is a low-level employee handling your digital presence, and that's a huge mistake. No matter if you're a small company and a startup or a really large brand, uh, like DiGiorno, you need to make sure that these people understand the brand and are valued brand ambassadors um, because they're the voice of you're it. You're your company spokesperson. It should be no different than who you would trust to talk to the Wall Street Journal. So you likely have a lot more questions and want to listen and talk more about branding and social media and how you use this. And we have a few different podcasts and books that we'd recommend you listen to and on your next drive into work or your next road trip. Um, some podcasts are Entrepreneurs on Fire, Freakonomics, Startup School, Social Media Marketing, and a few great books if you want to grab out your highlighters and dog ear all these pages. Brandscaping, Jab, 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 Right Hook, All Marketers Tell Stories by Seth Godin, who we quoted early on in this presentation. And the last one is Made to Stick. You know, we gave this presentation a, a little while ago, and one question that came up that I think might have been... Um, on the minds of a lot of people in the room is we talk a lot of, about big brands here and the case studies that we 
We talk about it's easy to use recognizable brands, but what about a startup that's looking for funding um, and how important is all of this to that type of company where you're trying to get something off the ground and you're, you're, you're looking for that, um, you know, sort of that angel funding. I, I would argue that it's more important than ever at that point to be able to describe exactly what the value of your brand is. So whether or not you have a logo or whether or not you have um, collateral or business card, you really need to be able to say, this is the brand promise. This is what our story is. And this is why this is a valuable idea. So because it, that has to be uh, rock solid and people have to believe it. So it's that point early on that you have to believe in your brand to the point that you can convince others to believe in it. And never is that going to be more important than when you're trying to get people to invest in it. So for those of you who are entrepreneurs out there who may be just starting a venture, um, think through it. Think through exactly what it is and why it is that you're going into business. Uh, be able to say it in 8 to 10 seconds and make sure that everybody you bring on board believes it and make others believe it. So I thought that was a good question. 